The following episode of America the Podcast contains depictions of violence, including sounds of gunfire, cannon fire, and gore. Listener discretion is advised. Enjoy the show. This episode of America the Podcast is brought to you by the Real American Power Grid. Hey there, friend. You look, well, kind of panicked. What's that you say? You nearly froze to death last winter because the Texas power grid went out. You say that you're worried the same thing will happen again in a future winter. You say that you need me to get out of your face so that you can continue to doomsday prep. Well, before I leave, I should let you know that I have a solution for you. Introducing the Real American Power Grid. The Real American Power Grid comes from the radical idea that maybe a country as large, wealthy, and resourceful as America should have one interconnected, technologically up-to-date power grid fit to survive the ever-advancing climate crisis. Yes, with the Real American Power Grid, we don't just limit ourselves to oil and gas. No siree, Bob. At the Real American Company, we use every energy source the good Lord provides. Yes, we utilize solar, wind, nuclear, hydroelectric, geothermal, and even good old oil and gas for those of you still stuck in the past. No matter the energy source, we've got you covered. And since the Real American Power Grid uses every available energy source instead of demonizing the ones that don't donate to a particular political pack, this revolutionary grid will always have something powering it if and when the other energy sources temporarily fail. Similar to checks and balances in a government, except these really, really work. So act now and adopt the Real American Power Grid today instead of perpetually preparing for a winter or spring or summer or, God forbid, fall apocalypse. That's the Real American Power Grid, available wherever freedom is sold. So we've established that you are, in fact, a demigod, right? Correct. And confirmed the realness of the afterlife, which has garnered me many calls from the Catholic Church the past few years. They were, well, less than pleased that I interviewed those angels and the descendant of Jesus back during the search for Tim transmissions. All I have to say is thank the Protestant God for caller ID. Right. Well, that means there are other gods and demigods like you, right? Oh, yes. Many. I am friends with several and frenemies with most. Got it. Uh, That brings me to my actual question. Finally, I feel like I've been sitting here for days listening to you yammer on and on. It's literally been like 30 seconds. Ugh, fine. On with it then. Right. Okay. Uh, Well, I was wondering, who is the worst god you have ever met? Oh, that's easy. The vape god. Ew, there's an actual vape god? Oh, yes. His name is Tonovan Tonathan. Tonovan Tonathan? With... Tonovan Tonathan, with T's, yes. Gross. Yes, well, he's a gross person. I mean, you know I want you to elaborate on that, right? All right, fine. Let's see. Uh, Tonovan Tonathan was a man until he created a vape cloud so magnificent it caused him to ascend to godhood and adopt his absurd name. While he was still mortal, his name was Eugene Horowitz, a 27-year-old incel from Long Island. He makes the room instantly smell like Teddy Grahams when he walks in, a food I loved until that asshole showed up on the scene wearing his Jinkos, Affliction t-shirt, flat-billed cap, and a ball-chain necklace the size of the asteroid belt. Uh, let's see. Oh, uh, he has a tattoo of what he thinks is the Japanese character for love, but is actually Laotian for the phrase anal sex. Two written languages that look nothing alike. Yes, even I'm aware of that, and that should say something. Uh, let's see. He's always wearing his fake Oakleys that he stole from his job at the knockoff sunglass hut in the Mall of America. Are the sunglasses hanging off the back of his neck? Of course. He wears them on his eyes when he drives around Long Island in his Bugatti La Bature Noir, an $18.7 million car that he bought and then wrecked as he drove it out of the dealership parking lot. The back bumper is still duct taped on. He also loves to say the phrases, you can't joke about anything anymore, and I'm not a racist, but, and then, well, gets real racist real fast. Can't you and the other gods kick him out? No can do. Until humanity stops believing in a god, that god is here to stay. Or until they evolve into a greater god like some sort of a Pokemon. Super weird sight to see. Huh. When's the last time that happened? Oh, do you remember Tom from MySpace? Yeah. And when's the last time you saw him? 
Did he die or evolve? Well, let's just say there's a reason Zuckerberg looks like he's wearing a misfitting human suit. Wow, that answers a lot. Do you know what else needs to be answered? What? Why the American people, of course. Why? Are they talking to us? Hello? They're always talking to us, Timothy. I hear America's prayers just like God, except I don't let them go to voicemail on a regular basis. God more or less invented the concept of screening calls. What are the American people praying for now? They are shouting a request to the heavens, hoping that I, Abadai S. A. Starred, the embodiment of an only hope for America, tell the story of America's most infamous traitor. Donald Trump? No, this story isn't as recent or as racist. This is a tale of what happens when a self-entitled white man doesn't get what he wants. A man who went from being a pretty solid acquaintance of mine and an absolute amoral maniac on the battlefield to a sad outcast with a name synonymous with the word treason. This is the Ballad of Benedict Arnold, tonight on America the Podcast. <laughs> Our story begins, or rather Ben's story begins, in Norwich, Connecticut on January 14th, 1741. He was born to a wealthy family, and his grandfather even served as the governor of Rhode Island at one point. Ben was also descended from the Reverend John Lathrop, one of the first advocates of separation of church and state, which should kick in, no, any day now. Life was not always best for Ben. His father began drinking and lost his business shortly after the death of two of Ben's siblings. Ben himself was then sold into indentured servitude to an apothecary. Jesus, after all that, he became a slave? And owned slaves himself later on, so don't feel too bad for him. Benedict lived such a lavish lifestyle that even I was like, hey man, maybe save a few coins. A man named John Brown once wrote in a pamphlet about Benedict that money is this man's god and to get enough of it, he would sacrifice his country. <laughs> Shit, that's pretty ominous. Agreed. While I do love money more than life, I would never betray my country for it. Especially British money. It's not even green. It's backed in a, what, a subpar silver instead of glorious gold. I pushed to have our currency backed in diamonds, but was overruled by Alexander Hamilton because I, quote, owned most of the diamonds in the world at the time, end quote. Anyways, as for the past debts of Ben's father, those were eventually paid off by Ben when he became a man of business himself. However, when it comes to the crown and the colonies, with money come the taxes. As you know, myself and a plethora of other patriots, including Benedict, were taxed ruthlessly under the crown of goddamn King George. Yes, and then you guys started a war over it, even though the taxes really only affected the rich. What can I say? I would do almost anything for love. Love of money, that is. You get that, right? I mentioned my devout love for money a second ago and just want to make sure you heard me, because I love it. Money. Especially American dollars. Also America. Christ! Yes, I heard you. I get it. Fantastic! As I was shouting, these taxes pissed off Benedict, which prompted him to join the Sons of Liberty a decade before the revolution itself. He even formed his own militia in his home state of Connecticut. This came in handy when the war came, as Ben was able to mobilize his forces quickly and effectively. How did you meet him? Ah, I was traveling with Ethan Allen and the Green Mountain Boys for a bit. They were a rough bunch that liked to get hammered and kill British, and I was all about that vibe, as the kids say. Do they say that? I, I don't know. I thought you knew. Nope. Hmm, I see. One moment. Can someone get us a kid in here? No, 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 no. We don't need to do that. What? Do we not have a kid budget anymore? No, and I told you to stop referring to the budget we have for child actors as a kid budget. It's weird. Very well, then. It was May 1775, I believe, and we had just encountered Ben and his men on the way to take Fort Ticonderoga. Ben was having a hissy fit because Ethan was in charge instead of him. In what would become a usual display, Ben was arguing with his fellow officers, Ethan Allen and James Easton. But I should be in charge, not Ethan. Me and my men were here first. Is this guy serious? I'm the ranking colonel here, Benny boy. Do you even understand how the chain of command works? Fine. If I can't be in charge here, then I shall be Commodore of the American Navy on Lake Champlain when the ships are captured. What a bloody fool you are. Fuck you, James. I challenge you to a duel. Oh, would you look at that? Angry old Ben wants to challenge another person to a duel. Why, you son of a... 
Jesus, that son of a bitch kicked me in the head. I think I'm bleeding. Jesus Christ. Gentlemen, gentlemen, stop this now. You, what's your name, Colonel? Benedict Arnold. And who the hell are you? Oh boy, this should be fun. I'm a man you do not want to mess with and who outranks you in more ways than you could possibly comprehend. Now sit down. Or stand, I really don't care. Just stop kicking your fellow patriots. Your bickering is going to get us nowhere. Do you want me to bring in a general? No, sir. Very good. Now, I understand there is a question of who's in charge. Ethan and the Green Mountain Boys were ordered to take this fort. While you and your men's help will be greatly appreciated in the upcoming battle, you were not put in charge. However, we can still keep things smooth and assure everyone's orders are followed. How about you be co-leaders? Fine with me. That's ridiculous. Listen, Buford, is it? It's Benedict. Very well. Listen, Ben, do you want Ethan's men to listen to your goddamn orders or not? I did not watch my friends die face down in the muck to have multiple distinguished officers go at each other in front of their own men. Benedict's the one who can't seem to comprehend the chain of command. That's enough, Colonel Allen. Listen up, men. Colonel Ethan Allen and Colonel Benedict Arnold are both in charge here, but Colonel Allen will be taking the lead. Is that understood, Benedict? Yes, sir. Uh... Sounds good to me, Mr. Stodd. Very good. I'll be in my tent. Who was that man, and how in the world does he outrank us? I see no insignia on his coat. But he's one of our master spies, and let's just say he's, uh, sort of on top. What the hell does that mean? Huh. <laughs> well, if you don't know, Benny boy, then I'm sure there's a damn good reason. What was Ethan referring to? Ah, he was referring to a sort of a uh, top secret leadership pact that I started and was in charge of that included the most influential members of American leadership. Like the Masons or something? Oh no, that's a separate group. This operated more like its own, no, oh, well, like its own state that always had the best interest of the country in mind and would help keep the country going if our public leadership fell. To keep our meetings confidential, we would congregate deep underground in one of many bunkers that I had built. So you started and headed the original deep state? A little bit, yes. Between that and dictating the official version of the Declaration of Independence, it is no wonder I was selected to become the embodiment of an only hope for America. Who knew you had become the embodiment when you did? Quite a few people, actually. Ben Franklin, General Washington, Ethan Allen, Thomas Jefferson, oh, oh, the three children from Liberty's Kids, Patrick Henry, uh, the Adams cousins, all instinctively knew what had happened to me. The blood of the country truly ran through their veins. Those at the higher echelons of our revolution that didn't know about me outright were made aware over time. My existence was one of America's closest guarded secrets, well, until I started this radio show. Did Benedict ever find out? Not during the war, at least, and thank the old and new gods that he didn't. The crown would have thrown everything they had at us if they knew about me. Wasn't Benedict an early adopter of the revolution? You think he would have found out with everyone else? You have a good point for once in your life, Timothy. The gods above, who transfigured me into the magnificent specimen you see before you, likely prevented Benedict from knowing who I was since they knew what he would end up doing. The force moves in mysterious ways, my friend. Sometimes, it's best for even me not to question it. But he was a major general in charge of West Point at one... Well, point. Shouldn't he have been made aware? There were a lot of generals at different levels during the war. Benedict was a, uh, a lower level one, and was only famous at the time for what he did at Saratoga. Not Ticonderoga? Oh, no. When the time came to actually raid the fort, our men did so quietly and without a single casualty. 80 soldiers stuck across the lake on May 10th and 75, forced the British to surrender, and then me, Ethan, and the rest of the Green Mountain Boys stole all of the Crown's liquor. <laughs> Got really drunk that day. Those guys could really put them back. Ethan also didn't give Benedict a single bit of credit for the attack in his memoir or to the generals when he reported back after I had left their battalion. The only reason anyone knows Benedict was there was because I told Congress later on when I gave my regular report. Damn, he must have really pissed Ethan off. Indeed, not to mention fracturing James Easton's skull with that roundhouse kick. Ben eventually took a few British ships while me and the boys were still getting drunk. He burned all of them except a battleship which he renamed the Enterprise. It was the first American ship with that name and, well, apparently won't be the last if Star Trek is to be believed. And from what I understand, that show is shot in real time and then sent back to the past. I don't think that's correct, but that's cool he named the ship the Enterprise. I assume the British were less than pleased about losing that many boats? Oh yes. The victory gave America control of Lake Champlain for a time and royally pissed off those still loyal to the concept of royalty. 
Benedict basically aggravated every human he came in contact with. The majority were usually commanding officers. Right. So, um, what happened at Saratoga? Wouldn't you like to know? I mean, yeah. I literally just asked, so I do want to know. Well, you're going to have to wait. Why? The episode isn't over. No, but it has come to the halfway point and my wallet is feeling a little light, which means I need to siphon off some cash from our listeners through the following commercials. We'll be right back. It's America, the podcast. America, the podcast is brought to you by Running for President. Running for President. Channel your inner megalomaniac all the way to victory. It's America, the podcast. And we're back, America. So, you wanted to know about Saratoga, yes? Yes. Well, you're going to have to wait until after this commercial. What? We just had one. Too bad. I want more money. <laughs> we'll be right back. God damn it. It's America! The Podcast! America the Podcast is brought to you by Bipartisanship in Congress. Bipartisanship in Congress. <laughs> Just kidding. That's not a thing. It's America the Podcast! And we're back. Uh, finally. So, Saratoga, correct? Yes, Saratoga, please. Well, I'll tell you after this commercial. We'll be right- No, I'm cutting you off. Tell the fucking story. Fine. All right, let's see. Um, all right. Ben had attempted to stop the British from invading New York, but was overwhelmed by their forces. To avoid being captured, Ben and his men burnt their own ships. Damn, that's hardcore. Indeed. Ben eventually received the nickname the American Hannibal, a name echoing that of the ancient conqueror, mostly because of his battle performance. There also might have been an elephant or two there, I don't remember. Most British commanders viewed him as the most dangerous man in America and were afraid to even face him. I figured you would try to take that title. Oh, I did, but not until the Civil War. To be honest, I took a lot of inspiration from Benedict's battle tactics and implemented them into my own. Benedict would regularly charge straight out to the front lines with his men. The only times he ever had to stop were the two times he got shot in the leg. From what I was told by General Washington, the first was when he tried to take Quebec. A lot of good fishing in Quebec. Indeed. I hear there's great fishing in Quebec. Fantastic fishing in Quebec. Indeed. Anyways, as for the second time Ben was shot, well, that brings us to the Battles of Saratoga, actually. Battles? Plural? Yes, there were multiple skirmishes beginning on September 19, 1777 at Freeman's Farm. As you know, Ben had a tendency to get pissy with his superiors. He would always criticize but could never take said criticism himself. This was no exception when it came to Ben's personal enemy number one, General Horatio Gates, a person I also consider a traitor because of his involvement at the Conway Cabal. America can go back and listen to the previous episode for reference. I don't repeat myself. What? I said I don't repeat... Uh, <laughs> nice try. Thank you. Yes, well, as I was proclaiming, Ben was battling British General Burgoyne at Freeman's farm. Burgoyne was gaining control of the farm, but not without Ben and his men reducing the British numbers significantly. Ben eventually sent a request for reinforcements, but instead, General Gates recalled him from battle and reprimanded him. Why'd he do that? Because Benedict, the second in command of the entire operation, more or less convinced General Washington to let him go in and fight after Gates said they shouldn't. Gates' decision turned out to be incorrect, a, <laughs> a running theme throughout that man's life. Gates ended up having Colonel Wilkinson transfer command of the riflemen that Ben was leading to a different officer. Simply put, Gates sort of had it out for Ben. I recall him mentioning to me and other officers that he feared Washington favored Benedict over him. Was that true? Pretty much. Probably why he joined Conway's cabal. Needless to say, the transferring of those troops significantly angered Ben. See? Look at him. Walking up to our tent all red and pissy. <laughs> like a tomato trying to be intimidating. What is the meaning of this? You dare transfer my men? We needed more men! Be quiet, Benedict. I will not. We were winning the battle and you forced us to retreat. I am tired of your insubordination. Come off it, Horatio. You know as well as I do he wasn't being insubordinate. I told you General Washington allowed the attacks and I also recommended more men. Stay out of this, spy master. You're only here because I allow it. Ta! I believe it may be the other way around, my friend, but please. Do go ahead and tell the battle-winning, psychotic, bloodthirsty maniac of a major general that he can't go kill some redcoats. Precisely my point. B 
battle-winning general. You will return my men to me this instant and let us back in. I will do no such thing. You think you can just tell your commanding officer what to do? You need to learn a lesson, Major General Benedict Arnold. You are hereby relieved of command and confined to your tent until further notice. But you are dismissed, Mr. Arnold. Damn, I can't believe you defended him. Hey, I calls him like I sees him. Ben was good at his job and Horatio was weak. He should have let Ben stay in battle instead of relieving him. How long did Ben's punishment last? Oh, until October 7th, I believe, so around 19 days. Meaning Ben's entitled white guy anger had time to fester. I had finally convinced General Gates to go back into battle and didn't want to risk losing Saratoga. So, I made sure to call in a ringer. Son of a bitch. That stupid bastard couldn't lead a horse to water, let alone a battalion. Hey, Ben. Who's there? Show yourself! I challenge you to a duel! My god, sir! Would you stop challenging every living thing to a duel? Ah, the mysterious Mr. Stard. What are you doing in my tent? Well, I was going to reinstate you myself and let you know there is a battle going on, but if you're going to be an asshole, maybe stay here. Wait, 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 wait. My apologies, sir. No need for apologies, Ben. All I need from you is to get real fucking mad and go kill some goddamn bloody backs over at Bemis Heights. What do you say, Mr. Arnold? Absolutely, Mr. Stard. Very good. There's a horse and a rifle outside waiting for you. Get going. Yes, sir. By the way, how do you, a spy, command without an actual rank? I remember Mr. Allen saying that you were important to the country. He said that? Huh. I suppose I am. Especially now. You could say I always have the soul of the country inside of me and that, uh, my commitment to our cause is unshakable by default. Does that answer your question? No, sir. But I do trust you. Yeah. And with that, Benedict rode into the smoky haze of battle and I never saw him again. However, I, along with several of his men, did credit the Major General when Gates tried to diminish Ben's accomplishments. What kind of accomplishments? Well, Ben hopped on his horse and rode straight into battle, screaming like a madman. He rode right past his formal rifleman, who in turn followed his charge. Benedict ended up taking a British redoubt, which is a kind of mini-fort in the middle of a battlefield. His charge would have kept going if his horse hadn't been killed and a soldier had not shot him point blank in the leg. When his men tried to kill the soldier who delivered the shot, Ben defended him, saying the kid was just doing his job. Can't say I would have done the same, especially since Ben nearly lost his leg and never really walked right again after that. After the Battle of Bemis Heights, General Burgoyne surrendered and the Siege of Saratoga was complete. The whole ordeal even ended up convincing France to enter the war and help with our revolution. Damn, that is nuts! And Gates tried to tell Washington that Benedict did nothing? Indeed. I, of course, set the record straight, but Ben still threatened to retire. He had already been passed over for promotions numerous times and had no respect for those who had been promoted over him. However, after I had told Washington what had happened, he promptly offered Ben the position of military governor of Philadelphia. That sounds like a pretty sweet gig. It was for a while. After he became governor, Ben met and married an 18-year-old British sympathizer named Peggy Shippen, who just so happened to be the ex-girlfriend of British spy chief John Andre, whom you will meet at the end of this story. Ben also abused his power as governor and made a bunch of shady deals to enrich himself. You know, general rich white guy stuff. <laughs> I'm sure that went over real well with the Patriots. Ha! It did not. The president of Pennsylvania and an old friend of mine, Joseph Reed, thought of Ben as a traitor because of his marriage to Peggy and the fact that he frequently fraternized with British loyalists. Joseph also caught wind of all of the business deals Ben had been making and the numerous abuses of power. He even led a mob to burn an effigy outside Ben and Peggy's home. When that happened, it was officially the beginning of the end for Benedict's time as a patriot. And with that, we will take one final break so that I can earn enough money for my listeners to order a pizza on one of these food apps on my phone. Would you like some pizza, Timothy? Ha! <laughs> Absolutely! Well, too bad. It's all for me. Be a real American and pull yourself up by your bootstraps and earn enough money to order your own pizza. I wear vans, not boots. And I run a podcast company. I have money to order my own. Still, I don't want to order twice. Can't we just share? The phrases, I have money, and I run a podcast company typically don't go together, so I will assume you're lying. Also, I am unfamiliar with this word, share. While I look that up in my American dictionary, you, the American people, can give me your American dollars to fund my, Italian, pizza habit by listening to these ads. We'll be right back. It's America, the podcast. (laughs) 
America the Podcast is brought to you by Perfectly Manicured Front Lawns. Perfectly Manicured Front Lawns. Prove to your neighbors you can waste more money than any of them. It's America the Podcast! And we're back with the Ballad of Benedict Cumberbatch. It's Benedict Arnold? No, oh, right. I uh, always forget Cumberbatch didn't fight in the revolution. Do you actually forget that? No, I just misspoke and was trying to cover it up. Thanks for blowing it. Right. Um, okay, so the story of the traitor. I assume you were there the day he defected? Indeed I was. The plot of Benedict Arnold was exposed on September 23rd, 1780. Benedict had just been given command of West Point at the beginning of August, but in 1779, Ben's wife Peggy had convinced Ben to switch sides. Through letters, she introduced her husband to John Andre, the spy chief I mentioned earlier. They discussed his options and eventually came to a deal good enough for Ben to betray his country and what few friends he had. In exchange for a general's commission, 20,000 pounds sterling, and a few other factors, Ben began giving away our troop locations through sexually explicit letters. Wait, what? Ah, right. Since John was Peggy's ex, Ben was allegedly a tad jealous. The letters were addressed to Peggy, but would get intercepted by John's men. Beneath what seemed like a raunchy letter from a horny man to his wife were coded messages to John Andre. Ben wrote the letters this way because he knew John would read them and then get annoyed. <laughs> That's pretty spiteful, but also, uh, it's a little funny. Oh, I thought it was hilarious when I found out. In another life, Ben and I could have been good friends, but he had to go be a big dumb betrayer. In July of 79, Ben struck his deal with the British and started sending those sexy messages. During his correspondence, he was ordered by the British to seek command of West Point. Damn, so he got away with this for a while. Oh yes, and it was all because he was passed over for promotion. The irony is if he had just been promoted, and if he had, you know, not defected, America would have won the war faster. Is that the consequences of a white man not getting what he wants you mentioned earlier? Not quite. I'll discuss that at the end. As for the plot exposure, myself, General Washington, Alexander Hamilton, the Marquis, and some other officers had been invited to Benedict's residence at West Point for dinner. Little did we know that he had planned to surrender West Point to the British with all of us inside. Whoa, seriously? I mean, oof, that's kind of genius. Agreed. Ben may have been a traitor, but game respects game, as they say. The problem with his plan was the middleman between John and Ben, Joshua Smith. When Joshua was trying to get John back to his ship on the day of the plot exposure, he placed a shitty old cloak on the spy and sent him on his way. John, however, was still dressed in his red coat and stuck out like a, well, a red coat in the colonies, I guess. Because of that, some militiamen caught Mr. Andre and brought him back to an American camp. During an interrogation, our men found some documents on Andre's person, a signed letter from Benedict as well as plans. All the while, he still tried to claim that he was a spy for Benedict. I assume that didn't work? You assume correctly. Seeing John's story as obvious bullshit, the commander at the camp sent the plan straight to General Washington. The men at the camp had not fully realized that Ben was the traitor, so they sent a letter to Ben telling him who and what they had found and let Ben know that the plans that were discovered had been sent to the general. Ben then tried to deflect when he was confronted by his secretary, Major Franks, by getting mad that the militiamen had broke the chain of command by not bringing the plans directly to Ben himself. Good lord, why did he sign that letter? Didn't they have code names or something? I have no idea why he signed it. Maybe out of pride or just general stupidity. As for code names, John went by John Anderson, real creative there, but Benedict went by Monk, and not the fun OCD kind. His name was taken from George Monk, a famous British trader. Yeah, that fits. Indeed. Upon receiving this information, Peggy instructed Ben to gather his things and run. He just left her and their kids there? She told him not to worry because they wouldn't hang a woman and she would just play dumb, which back then we just called playing woman. God, y'all were terrible. Yes, well, America progressively gets worse before it gets better, and even it being better seems to be constantly up for debate. Yeah, well, all right, uh, what did y'all do when you found out about Ben? Well, General Washington was, let's say, less than pleased. Here, watch. Sir, a message for General Washington. It's urgent. Thank you, soldier. What the hell? Oh my god. General! What is it, Mr. Stard? Sir, you need to see this. No, no, no! Ah! Arnold has betrayed us! Ah! Whom shall we trust now? Son of a bitch. Search the area! Find Benedict Arnold and bring him here now! Hey, Gil, feel like hunting a traitor? We, oui, Monsieur Stoud. At ease, gentlemen. You'll have plenty of time to hunt. Let us first check inside for Mr. Arnold's wife and children. 
Mrs. Arnold, are you here? Stay away! You're here to assassinate me! You're, you're here to kill my baby! Uh, Ma'am, we're here to do no such thing. Are you all right, Mrs. Arnold? Where is your husband? He's gone! He's left us here! I think he might have been a traitor. Whoa, wait. Are we sure she's not in on the plot? It seems like a perfect alibi to just pin the whole conspiracy on Ben. You know as well as I do that a woman couldn't do something like this. I have used many women in many different spy operations. Trust me, sir. It's possible. Please don't kill my baby! That's enough, Mr. Stard. I promise that you and your children are safe, Mrs. Arnold. You may collect yourself, your children, and your things. You'll be granted safe passage wherever you need to go. Now, Thebadias, Gilbert, go find him. Now! We oui, monsieur. Yes, sir. Damn, y'all really believed her story? Well, I didn't, but what were we going to do? Hang a mother of three who was just probably scared for her family? Uh, yeah, fair enough. Uh, wait, what happened to Andre? Oh, right. I'll take us there real quick. There we are, and, uh, ah, there's John Andre over there. Major John Andre, you are hereby sentenced to death by hanging for espionage against the American states. May God have mercy on your soul. Jesus, you could have just told me you executed him instead of showing me. Eh, it's more fun this way. Uh, all right, well, what happened to Ben? Well, he fought some battles for the British, and then he and Peggy went on to London after the war, but were social outcasts. They then tried to make it in Canada, but had another effigy burned outside their home. One of the last things I ever heard of him doing was trying to duel the Duke of Lauderdale over something uh, trivial, from what I understand. Always dueling that guy. Did he ever give a reason for the treason? <laughs> yes, it was called To the Inhabitants of America, and I can say with certainty that the inhabitants hated it. He tried to blame everything on the quote-unquote corruption of Congress. He didn't like the Catholics or the French, and he thought we'd do better under, guess what, the goddamn crown. Oh, Jesus, this guy. In the end, he left this world in delirium and requested that his colonial uniform be placed upon him as he died and stated, Let me die in this old uniform in which I fought my battles. May God forgive me for ever having put on another. Wow. Well, what about this consequence of not giving this entitled dickhead his way? Ah, yes. It is true, in my opinion, that we might have won the war faster by giving Ben more command power. But there are a lot of people, including myself, that think Ben would have tried to position himself as a dictator had we given him his way. However, that is something we'll never know. What I do know, aside from, well, literally everything, of course, is this. When Ben defected, it lit the spark that ignited the fire that our rebellion needed then assumed thousands would follow him, when in reality it was less than 30 men. And as we all know, assuming makes an ass out of you and me, but in this case, Benedict was the only ass. All in all, the treason of Benedict Arnold turned out to do more damage to the British than good. Instead, angry old Ben inspired the American people so much that, despite our regional and sometimes philosophical differences, we all came together more united than ever, all in the names of liberty, freedom, and, well, fuck that guy Benedict. If we had given in to his self-entitled demands, well, I don't think the country would have survived. Such a shame. He did so much, and then, well, that. Yes, well, it is indeed tragic. As a brigadier general for the British, he led scorched earth-style campaigns in his home state of Connecticut and in Virginia as well. He even almost captured Thomas Jefferson in the process. We were all distraught at the treason, but we're better off for it. Besides, who wants a guy around who constantly gets into fights and that you constantly have to apologize for? Sounds like a terrible friend. I mean, why would you even want to remember him? Well, wait, actually, he did get that monument, technically. Really? You gave him a monument? Well, yes, but I did say technically, and it's at Saratoga, but it doesn't mention his name. It just simply reads, In memory of the most brilliant soldier of the Continental Army who was desperately wounded on this spot, the Sally Port of Burgoyne's Great Redoubt, 7th October 1777, winning for his countrymen the decisive battle of the American Revolution, and for himself, the rank of Major General. Wow. Oh, well, all right. Um, well, what's next? The end, my friend. Next time, I will tell you the tale about how I single-handedly won the Battle of Yorktown. Single-handedly? Well, single-handedly with the help of, uh, several thousand soldiers. That's what I thought. <laughs>
Yes, well, for now, you get some sleep, America. I don't care if it's in the middle of the day or if you just woke up from your night's sleep. Take a nap, and then maybe scroll TikTok for a bit. And while you're there, you can follow my very important show, at America the Podcast, on TikTok and Instagram and Facebook. It's at America the Pod on Twitter, but Twitter is a gross place full of gargoyles and incels, so I tend not to be on there these days. That said, I'll be in your ears again next week, America, for the next installment of America the Podcast presents the American Revolution here on America the Podcast. Jesus, Lord, you know you only have to say the name of the show once, right? Yes, but I'm scared they'll forget. Don't forget me, America. I will never forget you. Except for that one guy. What was his name? Eh, it's gone. Anyways, good night and good fight. It's America the Podcast. This has been America the Podcast presents the American Revolution. The show is produced and distributed by Shway Media and is part of the Shway Media Podcast Network. The show was created by Tim Philippi and is hosted by me, Thamadias A. Stard, a.k.a. the Bastard, a.k.a. the embodiment of an only hope for America. Writers for the show include Tim Philippi, Alana Matos, and of course me, Thamadias A. Stard. Andrew K. Turner and Alexa Schreffler write for my very important social media platforms. The show is recorded in Shway Media Studios and is mixed and edited by Tim Philippi. Producers for America the Podcast are Tim Philippi and Alana Matos. Due to some audio issues we experienced while traveling through the space-time continuum or something dumb like that, additional voices heard in this show were provided by me, Thabadias Starr, Andrew K. Turner as Benedict Arnold and General Horatio Gates, Alana Matos as Peggy Shippen, and Tim Philippi as General George Washington and Major General Gilbert du Montier. Oh, come on, say the name. Ah, uh, fine. And Tim Philippi as General George Washington and Major General Lafayette. Lafayette. The show's theme song was composed by Timmy Two-Step, and all other music and sound effects heard in the show were procured through Storyblocks, Freesound.org, Ambient Mixer, Soundcrate, Accusonus, and Sonus. Lots of Sonuses out there. The show is available on all podcast directories and YouTube. While reviews on any and all podcast apps are greatly appreciated, I humbly request that you leave a five-star review in iTunes so that we may finally overtake the political podcast dynasty known as Pod Save America. They're not even funny. We know funny. Wait, do we know funny? We do not. Well then, let's overtake them anyways, America. For America! For daily video messages such as Previously on America and America's Word of the Day, follow the show on TikTok, Instagram, and Facebook at America the Podcast. And don't forget to check out all of the other spectacular Shway Media shows on the Shway Media Podcast Network at shwaymedia.com. There, did I say your name enough, you podcast overlords? All right, that's it. Go on now. You hear? This has been a production of Shway Media, all rights reserved. For more information, please visit shwaymedia.com. Thank you.